Exercise is so incredibly good for your health, and the health of your heart is a big part of that. But when you take exercise to extremes, doing more and pushing harder, is there a risk that you can then do too much and that it has a negative effect on your heart? If there is a risk of doing too much, you would have two prime candidates right here. An ex-pro cyclist who, despite having been long since retired, still treats every bike ride like a race, and a world record-breaking ultra-endurance cyclist. We've come to Leicester in the UK to meet a team of top cardiologists. Sai and I are gonna have an MRI scan on our heart, and I'm quite intrigued to see the results. We'll go sit down with the experts and see if there's any insights we can learn from. That's right. Do you ever think about your health, your heart health, when you're out doing ridiculously extreme things? I think like most bike riders, it's not something you're thinking about while you're riding the bike, getting competitive, pushing yourself. But I've been asked a lot in my career, you know, is this a safe level of exercise? What are you doing to yourself? And now I'm 40, maybe, I, worry. maybe I should care. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I think about it. I do worry. I've had an echo on my heart before that didn't show anything, thankfully. But um, this is next level, isn't it? So uh, yeah. anyway, let's go face our fears, shall we? <laughs> As you can see, this is actually the British Heart Foundation MRI facility here at Leicester, and this is where we're going to get our scans done. It's obviously a popular space. We've come at the weekend to get access to the machine and the amazing team here, so let's go. Let's do it. This state-of-the-art facility is part hospital, part research centre for the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences at Leicester University. Jerry McCann, Professor of Cardiac Imaging and Consultant Cardiologist, has been leading research that we are particularly interested in today, but several of his colleagues have also kindly agreed to join us as well. Firstly, Dr Matthew Graham Brown, an Associate Professor of Renal Medicine, on why no matter what the outcome for Mark and I today, there is one very important message that we shouldn't forget. So while Mark's in the scanner, I wanted to address a really fundamental question before we look at our fears of extreme exercise, but why exercise is so good for your health. So I'm talking to Matt here, who's done a load of research into exactly that, why exercise is so good for your heart health. So what, what's the main reasons for it? Well, so I mean, that's a pretty fundamental question, isn't it? And overwhelmingly, I think, really important thing to emphasise is that exercise is really good for people at a population level. So exercise, uh, you know, it helps control blood pressure. It helps um, people with you know, weight management. Uh, it reduces the risk of uh, the diseases of the blood vessels that go on to cause coronary artery disease that then might lead on to people having heart attacks or strokes. Um, it uh, is a good way of um, helping to modify your cholesterol. It strengthens your muscles, and that's a, you know so important for physical functioning going forward. And when people talk about exercise, you know, oftentimes it's quite off-putting for people. You know, you think about going out for a big run or a big cycle or a big swim. Really, exercise can be physical activity around the house as well. And we've got really good evidence that you know doing anything is better than doing nothing. And actually. Um, you know, there is a ceiling effect to the amount of exercise. So if, if you think you've got to be doing marathons, running marathons, doing ultra endurance events to be getting the benefits of exercise, you're wrong, you don't. Um, and actually, if you can get up to doing, you know, 30 minutes of um, activity, you know, four or five times a week, that's probably where the sweet spot is for, for physical activity, exercise, and, and improving all your health, not just your heart health. So overwhelmingly positive, and what we're talking about today is just represents a tiny, tiny proportion of the population. Absolutely, that's the key message really, is that at a population level, exercise and physical activity is really, really good for you, and it doesn't have to be you know, hours and hours of hard exercise. Um, if you're doing nothing, doing a little bit is good. If you're doing a little bit, doing a little bit more is good. Yeah. Mark was in and out in no time, so it was my turn next. I had, thank goodness, remembered to wear some decent underwear. I only wish I'd thought about my socks. Now, while I was undergoing my scan, Mark caught up with Dr. Anvisha Singh, consultant cardiologist and associate professor of cardiac imaging. It's fascinating listening to you work. I mean, there's a whole language here. It's all new to me. What, 
in, in simple terms, what, what are you looking for? I'm sure there's a, a huge, huge amount of complexity, but in an MRI, what are the, what are the, what are the basics that you're looking for? Um, so, in simple terms, what we're looking for is the overall structure, the size and the function of your heart. Um, so, you can scan a heart using lots of different techniques, but the advantage of MRI, as you'll see from the quality of the pictures that we're getting, is that it can really show you the borders of the heart muscle and where the blood volume is. And that allows you to measure in accurate detail exact volumes of your heart, um, different chambers of the heart, the ventricles, the atria, and also how much of that volume is being pumped with each heartbeat. And that gives us an assessment of the overall function of the heart, uh, otherwise called the ejection fraction. Um, so in, in simple terms, that's what we're looking for when we're assessing the structure and function of the heart. With my scan now complete as well, it was time for the team to take a close look at the incredible and detailed images they'd taken. Well, I'm pleased to have got some clothes back on now. Um, Jerry has been going through the scans, haven't you? So, Absolutely. What, what can you tell us about the state we're in? Okay, Sam, if we take yours first, these are your pictures on the heart. What was uh, obvious right at the beginning is your heart rate was nice and low, very steady at 50 beats per minute, which we see in a lot of athletes. If we look here on the screen, this is your four chamber, the four main chambers in the heart. And what we saw was the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber of the heart was just mildly dilated. And that's very typical what we see with endurance athletes. Often not elite athletes either, let's say people who are doing regular recreational, maybe uh, sort of amateur competitive athletes. Um, and interestingly, the top chamber, the left atrium, which we are particularly interested in, was just borderline dilated, probably within the normal range. So if we were sent you as a clinical patient to see whether you had an abnormal heart, we would say that the changes we're seeing are very much consistent with athletic activity uh, and adaptation secondary to endurance exercise. Okay. Do you know why those adaptations occur? Is it because the heart is a muscle and because it's working harder it therefore gets bigger or so the, stronger. So the analogy I use is exactly like, like that when we're talking to people. Your heart is a muscle like most other muscles. So if you think about your bodybuilders, if you load your heart muscle, you look at Arnold Schwarzenegger or someone, if you do real power-based stuff, you get big muscles. And the heart responds in a similar way to that if you load it with pressure. So if the valve becomes severely narrowed or you're doing really heavy lifting isometric exercise, you tend to get thickening of the heart muscle and it's not volume loaded. Now, when you do endurance exercise, your heart rate increases and particularly during training, when you might have that elevated heart rate for two or three hours at a time or longer for elite athletes, your cardiac output is sustained, there is more blood coming through and your heart dilates to cope with the increased uh, return of the blood to the heart and it pumps more. But of course the adaptation for the heart isn't as strong as it is for other muscles because your heart's beating all the time and pumping against your blood pressure. So everybody's heart, no matter if they're exercising or not, is working constantly. So I think there is less potential, but what is clearly shown is this volume overload causes some dilatation, enlargement of the chambers of the heart, and most sports get a little bit of heart muscle thickening. I'm keen to know, I've been waiting patiently, how is my heart? So very similar to Simon, your heart rate was a bit um, lower. It was going down as low as 40. We saw a bit more variability with yours, um, going up to 50 beats per minute, proved a few technical issues with the scan because we like a nice regular heart rate. Uh, and the findings by and large are similar to Simon's. What we've seen is your left ventricle is mildly dilated, slightly more than Simon's. Um, but again, consistent with athletic training. Now what we saw when we measured it is your left atrium actually is significantly more dilated and the right atrium, which is the blue uh, outline here, is also dilated above the normal range. Now in most athletic training, uh, we would see enlargement of all four chambers. So this again is consistent. The function of the heart is completely normal. And again, if we were seeing this, uh, we would say it's very much consistent with athletic training. Now, one of the things we're interested in though, of course, is 
um, the degree of enlargement in the top chambers, which have generally had less focus. And we think the size of the left atrium could be related to the development of atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is an irregular uh, electrical activity in the top chamber of the heart and it loses its pumping function. Um, and the rhythm itself isn't dangerous, but uh, in the general population, particularly older people and those with other risk factors such as diabetes uh, or heart disease uh, or vascular disease, it does put you at risk of clots forming inside the heart and that can put you at increased risk of stroke. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to develop this, uh, but the left atrium is enlarged and, and what we're interested in is understanding uh, some of the elements associated with endurance training and whether these adaptations might partly explain why endurance athletes seem to be more prone to this irregular heart rate. Should people be concerned about atrial fibrillation and potentially endurance exercise putting you at a higher risk? Or is it something that if you get diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, the risk of stroke is something that you can treat or mitigate? Yes. So I think the first thing to say is, I don't think people should stop exercising because they were worried about developing atrial fibrillation in the future. The risk is relatively low. The older you get, the higher the risk, but the beneficial effects of exercise far outweigh it. Now, for everyone who does develop atrial fibrillation, you need that assessment of the risk. At this stage, we cannot say athletes are at higher risk of stroke. We don't know that. What we're trying to find out is whether they might be, because we know they have cardiac adaptations, mainly around increasing volumes, and particularly, I think the one we're concerned about is increasing left atrial volume and possibly the right atrium. So the study we have planned, we're going to look at athletes who have got intermittent atrial fibrillation versus those without, and we're going to do brain scans to see if there's any evidence where they may have had very small strokes that haven't caused symptoms. So we are really just at the beginning of understanding this condition and it will take a lot more re research over many years with lots of volunteers and not all athletes are going to respond the same. There's almost certainly genetic influences, there's environmental influences, there's other lifestyle factors. And one of the things that's well uh, shown now is that uh, alcohol consumption does seem to be directly related to the development of atrial fibrillation. I think what we need to understand is individual risk and what we would like to move towards is individualizing that risk as much as possible and whether let's say endurance exercise either puts you into a lower risk category or perhaps puts you into a higher risk category is what we need to know. Yeah. The thing what we want to avoid is um, aging uh, or unhealthy aging and if you think about much of that and a lot of focus on people losing uh, skeletal muscle volume and strength, which is called sarcopenia, or they become frail as they, older, as they get older. Exercise largely protects against that. And in fact, here in Leicester and many other places, we're looking at exercise as a therapy in these patients who have uh, long-term conditions across the whole, whole board. So there is no doubt that there are many beneficial effects of exercise, not to even touch on the psychological elements. And to go right back to what we know at the beginning, athletes live longer than the general population. I've got to say, I'm massively relieved and also quite surprised actually that we both seem to have squeaked through. I honestly thought we'd find something, particularly on yours. I, must... <laughs> I mean, the next time somebody says to me, Mark, do you think you're hurting yourself? I'll, I'll be able to give a much better answer. I'll be able to say, my left atrium is fine. Thank That's you very it. much. Not baggy in the slightest. Um, now, an awful lot to take home from this, isn't there? Yeah. It's been super interesting. 
clearly the benefits of exercise once again being reiterated. But we should also say, shouldn't we, that if you're worried about anything that has been talked about, and if you've got any kind of symptoms, then obviously make sure you get them checked out. You can't just crack on regardless. Yeah, absolutely. Ride your bike. And I think it's fascinating to also sort of realize that despite all the reassurance that Sai and I have seen today, the research is still, you know, in the coming years, critical to figure out just what does happen when you put yourself through pretty extreme training, ultra endurance. There's a lot still to be found out, and I, for one, will be fascinated to see what we find out about heart health. That's right, but after today, I think we can carry on doing what we're doing, which is great news. Crack on, keep, keep riding. And, and huge thank you to the team. The team today have come in at the weekend, not just that, but, you know, I think some of the research that built up to to, to, the, to this filming was, was, was through a lot of time and hard work by the team here, so massive thank you. That's right, and also to you, some of the GCN viewers as well, who helped out on a questionnaire that we put a shout out to on the uh, GCN show as well. Uh, as Mark said, huge thanks to the team here for putting up with us for the day. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up.